Welcome to Gross Anatomy. Are we live? We are live, Dr. Cohen, with Gross Anatomy Podcast. Where we still explain the sights, smells, and sounds of medicine, how it relates to pop culture, movies, TV, books, and Lauren Taylor and the world around us. Yes. And you're Lauren Taylor with a sinus infection? Yes, but on antibiotics, so hopefully getting better. Nice. And I'm Dr. Jason Cohen, not on any antibiotics, but hopefully you're going to feel better. What has your day been like today? I feel like you have a story. Well... You know, I run the pre-med program. So today we did our fall kickoff for our fall session. So we, so I just came from meeting all of our pre-meds in person and going over all the rules and the regulations and everything about the program. So I have that excited energy of youth. That's so nice. So, but then you had to cut like a bunch of people or a bunch of people didn't make the cut for a mentorship. It's that's unfortunately always the case. You know, we, um, you know, we only have so many slots in there, you know, we could just handle so many. So that's been the hardest part of this program is we get a ton of applicants, you know, sometimes hundreds, and we really have to narrow it down to anywhere, anywhere between 18 to 25, you know, per session. And we do three sessions a year. So while, you know, we've been doing it for eight years, so about a hundred students a year, um, but, you know, it'd be great if we could take more, but Unfortunately, we just well, yeah. Can't. Other people are just going to have to start some more mentoring programs. You guys do a lot. That's a lot of work. Yeah, or they could just figure out a way to duplicate me. <laughs> yes, duplicity. Uh, Is it, no, yes. that's not what it's called. Multiplicity. That was a good movie. Was that with Michael Keaton? Yeah. Right. That was an interesting movie. Yeah. Exactly. So, what are we doing today, Lauren? Well, on our last podcast that listeners can go listen to now we did one on the origin origins of superstition of superstitious beliefs um but you said you had something you wanted to add like superstitions of a surgeon maybe or like oh right that's right you know and which takes us into like sports you know i i played hockey growing up and and just like athletes and and even myself even though i'm not such an athlete but You know, especially over playoffs, you know, uh, athletes would have certain, you know, the whole no shave thing or or, you know, different sorts of things or even just things before a game, you know, the way you would tuck your jersey in or something like that. So, you know, as a surgeon, I find that, you know, it's there's some similarities between being a surgeon and being an athlete. In fact, a lot of surgeons, especially orthopedic surgeons, may have been athletes once upon a time um so you know we have certain you know idiosyncrasies and funny little habits that we do you know before surgery kind of like before playing a game you know i i when i would do sports i wouldn't necessarily like to play or do any kind of sport on a full stomach and i kind of feel that way about surgery too like i i you know i don't want to have a full stomach so i don't want to eat a big meal before surgery and um no matter what, like before I start a sport, I always had to go pee. Even if I didn't have to pee, I felt like I had to go pee beforehand. And I'm kind of the same way before surgery. I'm like, okay, I'm going to scrub, but let me go pee first. Even if I kind of don't have to, but just to kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a little bit of a super, not a superstition, but like, um, just like you get into kind of a habit and it works and you, and you want to keep doing the same thing the same way each time. I could see that. And I could also see like the training, like for like track or like a sport, like you have to get up early, you have to do all these like, you know, rigorous activities and stretches and all this stuff. And like, you kind of have to do the same for the, as a doctor mentally. Yeah. And, and even like, you know, putting on certain music for the, for it, you know, it is just like, you know, warming up for a game, you know, you have certain music for like the beginning of the surgery and then certain music for the middle of the surgery and then there's closing music that you listen to you know when when you're in the home stretch kind of just kind of closing up the patient when you're done you know that's a whole different vibe and and all of that so i just kind of wanted to mention that so this does get us into sports so there was an article in the new york times called nfl to neurosurgeon did you read it yeah well i'll tell you the truth i only read part of it because I don't have a subscription in the New York Times. So I had to like quickly scroll in and out of my phone 
So I would get to kind of get the gist of it because that blocking thing keeps popping up. Do you have a subscription to the New York Times? Um, I do. I I get, get it through my husband. I think like, I don't know, a credit card or something. We got it for some reason. Right. And I'm too cheap to get a subscription. Just one more thing for me to pay for and forget about and pay for it forever. So yeah, I, I totally and I get that. articles from the Times all the time from people. So next time you send me an article, you got to send me like uh, an attachment of it. So I don't have to open the Times. Well, this athlete, this former NFLer who's now a doctor. He's so a I doctor. I guess he's technically a neurosurgeon. How does that go? If he still has another he's... year of residency, maybe? Right. So once you're in your residency, you're doing your residency within that specialty. So he's a neurosurgery resident. Um, and theoretically, not until he graduates is he officially, you know, a full-fledged neurosurgeon. But he's a neurosurgeon already. I'll give him, I'll give him the credit. Uh, for that already. Right. And his name is Dr. Myron Role. It's R-O-L-L-E. So I don't know if you should say it Role. I'm not sure. I don't know. I didn't ask. I'm going to call him Dr. Myron, not out of disrespect, but I'm not wanting to mispronounce his last name. That's very um, kind of you. So when he was 25, he found out that like his NFL career was basically on the decline. Like he got let go from the Tennessee Titans. He tried to make the Pittsburgh Steelers roster and he didn't make it. And his mom reminded him of what else he wanted to be. Like in his life, he wanted to play in the NFL. And he also wanted to be a doctor. Those were like his two goals when he was like a little kid. And so he decided to become a neurosurgeon, which is just remarkable, I think, to be able to do both. It's pretty I guess amazing. You're saying there's like you have to have a lot of training for both. So I guess it kind of makes sense the mentality. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot of similarities in in sports, in in medical training, especially old time medical training, but definitely surgical training. You know that same mental and physical toughness uh, that that you have to endure to be a top athlete. To be an athlete, you really have to go through in you know between just learning all of that stuff and then dealing with the how much to cram in your brain in a short amount of time and how much lack of sleep and how much there's even, you know, the the whole, not hazing per se, but, you know, the whole training is kind of like, you know, training for sports. And and so there really is a lot of similarities, I think, between the two. I think so, too. And I think um, it's amazing what he's doing. He also is starting a mentoring program, but his is like mainly like 12 and 13 year old um, black children. He's teaching them like that they can become a doctor, too. Um, so he he mentors younger kids kids and his program is called honor roll r-o-l-l-e get it yeah um yeah but he has this philosophy have you ever heard of it it's well he wrote a book about it too there's the two percent philosophy that a football coach used to tell him that you can be two percent better than you were yesterday you can do it if you take small steps every single day toward a larger goal and it says it helps him make sense of the challenges the tasks and responsibilities Sounds nice. I'm like, maybe I should try to think of that. Like just 2%. Like he's trying to achieve that work-life balance too that you always talk about. Yeah, uh, that doesn't exist. That's a myth. Um, what if you try no, 2% every day? Yeah. I no, know. I read about that. And I don't know why it's 2%. Why not 1%? One, why not 1%? One but but, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I read that. And I he even wrote a book about it, I think. Yeah, he wrote a book called The 2% Way, How a Philosophy of a Small of small improvements took me to Oxford, the NFL and nerve surgery. No, I think that's a really cool way of striving. You know, we, you and I, we talked about the strive, you know, to strive, which I think is something to do. And um, I like that perspective. I had never really heard that or thought about that, but I, I think that's helpful to people of all ages, especially young people and students and, um, people who are in careers. I, I wish I had kind of thought about that. Just make yourself, don't, don't think that you're going to be the greatest or the best and just try to make yourself a drop better, you know, and yeah. two, why not 2%? And I think that's, that. and then keep building on that each time. I love right. that. So like 2% after a year, like you become a lot better at this thing you wanted to do. It definitely makes a lot more sense with physical stuff, you know, in, in terms of other things like that, but like in terms of a workout, it's definitely very easy to kind of especially when you're younger and you're working out and you're exercising you could really quantify that i'm going to get two percent you know i'm lifting today 150 pounds i'm going to lift two percent more tomorrow you know and yeah. so it, 
it's a lot easier to do that kind of thing. Exactly. And I guess he maybe wanted to write a book too, because he was inspired by Dr. Ben Carson. I remember him. He wrote Gifted Hands. He's in politics too. Yeah. He ran for president, didn't he? Uh, yeah, he did. Actually, he is in pediatric neurosurgery. I didn't realize that until I was just looking at my notes at John Hopkins. Yeah. And now he became like a, wasn't he housing secretary under, I forgot I what. Something too. I don't know what happened to him though. No, he got an appointment. Yeah. He was secretary of uh, housing and urban development. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he's still a practicing doctor or not. I don't think he is. I don't think he, he's 71 years old. I don't, I don't think he is. Is there like a cutoff? Is there no, an actual but, cutoff? No, but that's an interesting conversation too, is should there be a certain age when doctors need to retire or should retire? And whether it's, whether it's, um, especially in, in a field like surgery or something like that, should there be an age when you're no longer the primary surgeon? And I think it's it's a fun, interesting, debatable topic, but I don't know. That'll be difficult to to enforce, I think. But it's well, but it's you know an my interesting... brain going now. Like, have you ever noticed when doctors get older, do more people like evaluate them, or are they just so respected Not, that they're left alone to their own judgment? A little bit of both, but I think doctors, surgeons, kind of most of the time you know, will stop when they, when they think they're ready. You know, one, one of the guys who, who I worked with, um, who to some degree was a mentor, um, told the story how his dad was a surgeon too. And his dad just picked an arbitrary age that he said, okay, when I hit this age, as he got older, when I hit this age, I'm no longer going to be a primary surgeon. I'll assist and I'll do stuff like that. And he did it. And he was still in, you know, peak of his career, but he kind of just made that decision to kind of go out at the top of his game rather than at the bottom of his game. And interestingly, this, the, his son, who was the one I worked with, kind of did a very similar thing. He definitely could have gone on practicing, but part of it was he was never around with his wife and his wife always wanted to travel. And he, he had to give in to that a little bit while he was still healthy enough. But he really picked an age and he stuck to it. And he said, OK, at this age, I'm done. And and then, you know, then he went traveling the world with his wife. That's amazing. You're going to do that, too, someday. Yeah. But and and yeah, hopefully. Well, this guy, uh, Dr. Myron, he also he just had two sets of twins. So now he has four, four kids, which wow. I looked up because he's he's uh, working on the work life balance, you know, the two percent way. But I looked up how if that's possible, you know, naturally, and it is, but it's rare. It's like one in 700,000 or something like that, that it happens, you know, it can happen two in a row. It's right. Crazy. Do we, do you know if it's, did he say it was natural or you didn't look that up? I mean, I don't think he said, probably no one asked him. I was surprised that nobody asked. I figured he wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I wondered if there was something with football and neurosurgery, you know, like seeing injuries, if that's why he wanted to do it. But now that I'm, Notice Dr. Ben Carson, maybe that's why, maybe because he was inspired by his book. But this is so this podcast we wanted to do, we went athletes who became doctors because before we've done doctors who have amazing second careers, none of them actually became athletes. We'll be right, I mean, never go see the other way. But you were like, look up other athletes that you know have become doctors, and there are a lot of Olympians, which makes sense. Like I didn't write, recognize any of their names, but I mean, that makes sense because they have short careers anyways. And a lot of like Olympians can't really make money. Like they're not Michael Phelps. They don't get sponsors. They would have to go right. to careers. They're already in a good school usually because they have a athletic scholarship. So that would be why I would think that they would. But then there was another person that we had briefly talked about, like I think in 2019, he was in the Super Bowl. He was a doctor. And he was also a lineman in the Super Bowl. Remember that? He played for the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, I vaguely do remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Laurent Duver Duvernay Tardif. So, but he had to step back from the NFL because he had to complete his medical residency. He couldn't put it off any longer. What, you have like a four-year break where you can do your residency? I think there's, they give you a certain window to to finish and and in fact um the guest that we had on the show also um 
had to do that. Um, our guest. Um, yeah, Sandy Heck. I remember. Right. But I thought his and was he, shorter. But this one, I think it was maybe it was three years, three or four years he had. And so now I can't be in the NFL anymore. Who else? Do you know this player? He was a Yankee. Robert William Brown. He was an American professional know. baseball third baseman, an executive who was the president of the American League from 1984 to 1994. He's also a physician who studied for his medical degree during his eight-year playing career with the New York Yankees, where he was a member of four World Series championship teams while becoming a physician. Cool. So that was the most famous example I could find. Who else? That's all. I couldn't find a lot. Like, no one that I knew. Like no. Well, name. I knew there were a couple of hockey players, you know, as, as a kid with hockey. There was a, a guy named Randy Gregg who who played hockey and I think he may have even been on a Stanley cup team. Um, and he, he was a doctor and I think he was like a doctor while he was, I gotta look him up. I think he was even a doctor while he was playing hockey, which is super cool. And that's like think, Robert William Brown, this Yankee. He won four world series and was a doctor. It's pretty cool. Yeah. He played, he was a defense. Randy Gregg was a defenseman for the Oilers who, and actually won five Stanley Cups uh, uh, playing for the Oilers. And, but he was also, he was a doctor. And there's actually a, a an award given to, uh, at the Canadian Inter-University Sport, it's called, that's uh, given for excellence to the student athlete. So uh, in Canada. So, so he was both a doctor and uh ice hockey player which i thought was super cool that is super cool yeah i mean mm -hmm. I, I didn't see his name pop up but that's good that's a good one mm -hmm. and and his story was um same kind of thing he you know he was going to be a doctor but he wanted to play hockey and um somehow he was able to do both which which is fascinating there weren't any other famous doctor athletes not that I discovered. I think there may have been one or two other other hockey players when I was a kid, but I, I definitely remember Randy Gregg. And and I remember, you know, knowing that um, I wanted to be a doctor. You know, my dad would always be like, see, you know, you could you could be a doctor and be an ice hockey player, <laughs> even though I, I was never anywhere good enough to play ice hockey like that by any means. Um, I guess that's the thing. And that's what this doctor that is now a neurosurgeon was saying was like you can do it too but basically i'm like that just seems so hard but he no. says i don't think success looks like any particular person like he thinks everyone's built to be something brilliant which is yeah. a nice thought but right. uh, it's pretty amazing probably really can't be athletes like some people really right. aren't athletic yeah it's pretty amazing being great at like two totally different things like that both sports and medicine i mean that's you you know you you hit the genetic lottery to some degree when that happens yeah no i agree i mean that's why you get articles written about you it's not that common and why you get to write books yeah yeah an interesting thing though you know we definitely see in surgery but especially orthopedics um and physical rehab medicine a lot of people students who go into those careers are either you know former college or high school athletes who either experienced kind of an injury of their own or saw a lot of injuries and kind of got motivated by saying you know they were smart enough and they were good students and they were smart enough to say wow this is really cool and they kind of pursued you know uh that part of medicine and and it's funny a lot of orthopedic surgeons you know are are very athletic I can see that or you go in a career in sports medicine, whatever, whatever that actually means. I don't know. Yeah. The term a lot, sports medicine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's another cool thing to be like a team doctor, but those doctors don't tend to have been um, athletes necessarily. They, they or, or, or surgeons, they tend to be like general medical doctors or maybe emergency room doctors who then for whatever reason, make some connection and, and get to work for their sports teams. And that's kind of a fun thing to do also, kind of be part of a sports team to some degree, even though you're doctoring. And, and you know, we had Dr. Rob Heisinger, who's a friend and colleague 
um, who's an amazing doctor, we had him on as a podcast guest and he was the doctor to, I think the Raiders for years, years and years and got to, got to have some pretty amazing experiences. Yes. Everyone should check out that podcast if they haven't. And there you go. There you go. I think that's pretty good. Should we talk about any, any upcoming, um, TV movies, books or anything we're into? Oh, we just started watching, I think what, what the buzzy, buzzy show is that people are watching. Um, it's called The Watcher. Oh. On Netflix. It's about a true story, but I haven't looked up the true story because I want to see what happens in this series. It's like, unfortunately, it's a seven part series because I wish they would just like, you know, it's kind of tense. I want them right. to just like get to the Is it like a horror thing? It doesn't seem, I'm hoping nothing that bad happens, but again, I'm not looking it up because I don't want to spoil it, but someone is like you find out in the first episode, someone, they get it, this family gets a new house and someone literally is watching them and sending them notes saying that they're watching them and they're like in their house and it's based on a true story and like that's that, creepy there's all these other parts to it that make it creepy yeah that's i can't believe you're watching creepy yeah i i don't know how it started <laughs> i think my husband just started playing it and then it's one of those things where you kind of get sucked in because you want to see what happens right that's like that I, th- I thought the watcher was that movie where they go where there's the phone call and it's have you checked the children you know what's that <laughs> that's some horror movie you know back in the day i i thought it was called the watcher or something like that i don't remember it might have also be called that i'm not sure how horrible would that be that phone call or maybe yeah maybe this person that's writing these letters is referencing that i don't know right have you checked goose <laughs> no my god if i got those letters yeah we would be out of here so fast i'd be like no pretty creepy yeah All right, everybody. Thanks for listening to us here at Gross Anatomy. Bye. Bye. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening to Gross Anatomy. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you can check out more episodes on the evolving sights, smells, and sounds of medicine. Gross Anatomy is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition.